Welcome to another edition of Inside Government. In this special edition, we're featuring the Ministry of Romi. And my first guest, of course, is the minister responsible for the ministry, and that's the Honorable Christoph Emmanuel. Minister, thank you for joining us for this edition of Inside Government. Good to have you in the hot seat today. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. We wanted to get an insight, profile the ministry overall, first and foremost, and we wanted to start with you as its leader. Let's get to know you a little bit, and I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand and one times, but yes. tell us a little bit about Christopher Emmanuel. Well, first of all, let me let me say, you know, I got to thank Kimberly Myers and also Labriska Kutad very much, who are integral part of the ministry for having me here under a lot of reluctance. <laughs> However, I'm here still because they stuck to their guns and say, I'm not getting away this time, so I'm happy to be here. Actually, and of course, you know, you have asked me this question a few times, and I've given you the same answer over and over, telling you that it's a question that I sort of bittersweet, not really like to answer that much, because it always brings up some sad memories for me when I have to sort of invoke as to where I came from. You know, but, I mean, hey, it's, 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 it's what it is, and it's sort of growing pains, and it's just something you've got to deal with. But I still think, as much as I've done this before, people still don't know who I am unless I mention who my mom was. And then I always have to start from that background, sort of, and bring it up to where I am today. But I would, I would always say that I'm actually walking directly in the footsteps that, that she took, because she started out also in politics on the National Alliance. And same thing that I, I, I'm doing the same thing. And she also was a policy advisor for the central government at the time. And I was the same thing, also policy advisor for the National Alliance in Parliament. She didn't make it this far, you know. But I think it's something that she'll be proud of. So, of course, I'm the son of Lillian Stephen. For those who don't know, I always have to bring it back to that part of that tragic day. Yeah, 1996, when the two sisters lost their lives at Celebration Palace. Well, one was my mom and one was my, was my aunt. So I'm a seed of that tree, if you want to put it that way. From both sides of the family, actually, I have roots on both sides of the island. I carry both nationalities. Mm -hmm. But I've always been grounded and rooted mostly on the southern side of, of the island. Uh, went to Mac school, you know, you know. Went to academy, went to school in Trinidad, went to school in Holland, went to school in England. Came back to St. Martin in 2003. And basically, I was just telling them a while ago, I started out in radio. Also, I've been doing it for a number of years. Started out in television and jumped into politics. I don't want to go too far. Right away. Let's um, back up just a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get an insight into what was life like growing up in St. Martin. I wanted to see that through your eyes when I sat down and gave some thought to, you know, if I'm going to have a conversation with the minister, what do I really want to know? Well, what I've was been, life I've like been, for you? I've been the only child for a very long time. I'm, I'm, I have siblings, but I'm like 17 years older than my nearest or my closest sibling. So I've been an only, uh, only child for a very long time. But I had fun growing up on St. Martin because, you know, I would always make trouble on one side of the island when I'm with my mom and then run over to the other side of the island, you know, because he's trying to escape getting licks. So I would, <laughs> I would leave one side and come over, and then when I'm upset with my dad, I would leave one side. And so I had that, that, that luxury, and I grew up in Dong Street, and I had a beach and a pond and everything to your disposal, you know. So growing up back then in the 80s and the early 90s was fun in, in St. Martin. But it also had some sad times and boring times for me because on the northern side of the island again I was the only one had relations on the Dutch side so I was always alone because whenever they got school the Dutch side had vacation so I would be alone we grew up in Rambo and I couldn't wait and I was telling that to another cousin of mine I couldn't wait until the big vacation would start it for those on the French side because I'm at least I would have fun hanging around with my cousins and and friends and stuff like that on the French side. But St. Martin was fun back then because you, you, you were sort of free and you had to pay no bills. You know, you never had to worry about nothing because your parents was there, your grandparents was there. I mean, it's always fun having two because you, you Christmas time, oh my goodness, fireworks. And you go by one family on the Dutch side, you get all the cake you want. And you go by the other family on the Dutch side, on the French side, you get all the same cake. So it was always double fun for you 
growing up until reality hits in. You got to start to go to school. You got to get good grades. And responsibility starts to set in. You're like, I don't really like this because everything was being done for you as an only child for such a very long time. And again, you know, to fast forward after the death of my mom, I had to grow up very quickly because I was still in school when that happened. And things just, time seems to move much faster since then. Everything was more laid back. You had no worry in the world. Mm -hmm. But from since then, everything started to move pretty fast. Schools, you mentioned yeah. the Mac. Um, let's yeah. focus in on, on, on yeah. your school. We are a product of the yeah, Mac. Of course, of yeah. course. Went through yeah. the, the elementary school system. Yeah. What, what was high school for you? Well, you know, <laughs> the thing is, let me, let me tell you this story. I always tell people that I didn't like high school that much here in St. Martin because I remember I only did first form and second form. And the second trimester of second form, I remember telling my mother, I don't want to go to school anymore because I don't think these teachers are fair to me. And I stopped going to school. And one day she met these gentlemen that were selling books. They are called Cole Porters from the Seventh Adventist Church, and they told her about this school in Trinidad. High school wasn't fun for me in St. Martin because, you know, at that time it was just who's who. Who was, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, Cedric. You went to the same academy, and I mean, it's who got the best shoes and who got the best school bag. And at that time, I mean, you're coming from a poor family. You, you, your shoes is from Marshalls. You know, you got the karate shoes on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just what it was. So you're not in that in crowd. Yeah, I don't think it's changed too much. You know, now. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but, now it's, know. A, now it's um, whether you have uh, the Nikes and or, yeah. or someone. Yeah. So it's more brand um, yeah. than anything and else. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't that much fun for me. And whenever I go into schools now right. and I give them my story and I said, I remember I repeated Form 3. I repeated Form 5. And they kept us back in form six, grade six, not form, sorry, grade three, grade five, and grade six. Because they said, oh, yes, our grades wasn't good enough to go to academy, mm -hmm. but our grades, was, our grades wasn't high enough to go to academy, but our grades was too high to go to vocational school. So they created a second upper grade six for a few of us, and we had to go to that grade six. And the funny thing about it, when I went to Trinidad, they skipped me from Form 1 and put me in Form 2. And then they skipped me from Form 2 and put me in Form 3. I wrote CXE in Form 3. You know what CXE is. I didn't have to write it in Form 4 or Form 5. I wrote it in Form 3. Because they were like, okay, no, you're too advanced for Form 2, you're too advanced for Form 1. So we put you in Form 3. And I wrote History, English, and Social Studies in Form 3. Went over to Form 4, went over to Form 5, and there I did... I did um, geography, I did art, I did literature, and I, I did English also. Mm. But I didn't do math because I always felt, well, once I can count from one to ten, I never really wanted math. And nothing that I'm going to do or any career is going to have maths in it. Oh, my goodness, that was the biggest mistake ever. The first job I got in St. was accounting because I had to go right back to school to learn formulas and fractions and all those sort of things. Just why I ran from and I escaped from and I had to go right back doing it. Right. Can't take shortcuts. Yeah. Huh? Can't take shortcuts. Can't take shortcuts. No. no. Um, as, as a boy growing up, um, your drive, your passions, what were the things that, well, that moved well, you? Well, you know, I always, I mean, I mean, I grew up with women, you know, I, I didn't grow up with my dad, but it was always the women around us from other friends. It was my mom, my aunt, but I grew up with my aunt and my grandmother. Because my mother was young, she had me when she was very young, 17, back then in those days. And she was the first person in our whole family to go to college. And she went to college at 21. You know, and if you had me 17 and you go on to college 21, I'm left as a young boy, four and three years and five years old. So partially I grew up in Anguilla with my great aunt. And I was always back and forth and stuff like that. So, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe that's why I only have majority women in my cabinet. But, you know, my mom always tell me if you want to get things done right, you always give it to a woman to do. <laughs> and I don't think she have been wrong. Totally can relate. You know, they seem to get things done. Yeah. Are you a dad? Yes. Yes. 
What is like what, 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 what are the challenges that you face I'm putting now as a father? For sale. I think I'm gonna. <laughs> I always tell people that not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six children. Yes, yeah, six children, and it's fun. I always tell people children is gifts from God, so they're all mine. And yeah, it's only that they like to jump on you and drag you and pull you and pinch you. And I was always telling my daughter, yeah, when you get your boyfriend, you get up and go, you may bother with me anymore. Never, daddy. I say sure. I just tell my mom the same thing. So you know, but it's fun being a father. I like it. My less. Yeah, it's it's it's. It's really fun. Looking at your professional life now, um, you have as a passion uh, communications, yes. broadcast. Um, you've hosted uh, radio programs. Yes. Um, you've had an online television yes. broadcast. Yes. Um, why did you get into to broadcasting? Uh, you know, yeah, uh, I always have this discussion with my friends because they just say, but Christopher, you don't like to talk. You, you, you're always quiet. I don't tell people, I like to talk. I just like to talk when I feel like talking you know, when it's necessary to talk, you know. But I always had a passion to inform people. I think they had a right to know. And I always wanted to do it in a manner with giving them facts and not beating around the bush or cutting a line. There's no gray areas either or. It's either this is the way it is or this is not the way it is. And I remember Ian Vows and, you know, great guy. We used to host in the backyard with the young professionals. And you know what is so funny about that program? Kendall, Romaine, Rene Violinas, Lizanne Charles. You look back now and you say, you know, look at who was there back then. And they're all in certain positions right now. And then I reached to a point where I started to host the program by myself. I did it for almost like five, seven years. But I, I you know, I always felt as if I was being held back. You wanted to do so much more, but there's only certain things you can say on the radio. You know, you, there's a code of conduct, but it's not so online. You can say basically whatever you want to say online. There's no regulations. No one can come at you. And yeah, you can just do what you want. And that was my reason mostly for, for branching out into the online program. But I always, I always like to inform people of what is going on. And I always call myself a community activist. I wasn't, you know, what is going on within your area and in your neighborhood? Mm. That was my main drive for getting into it. And I still like it. I just don't have the time to do it. Right. Yeah. You ran for office um, a few times. Yes. And, um, and before being elected in, into parliament, um, I find it very unique that, you know, some people would try this once and never come back. Yeah. But you stuck with it. Yeah. Um, why did you? Because I never see it as just a one-time thing. And I always, I always tell people, I always felt as if there was sort of a little divine intervention and, and it was never to give up and keep going and keep going and keep going. And, and what I tell people, you know, this is not my first election, now my second election, now my third, now my fourth, now my f I ran four elections with PPA. And they'd be like, are you serious? I said, yes, from 2003. I was doing elections and I with, with, with the People's Progressive Alliance with Gracita, Don Hughes. You know, I started out there, but I never really stopped. It was always, because, because when you stop, then, you know, people forgot, they forget who you are. And you sort of lose that drive and that momentum that you build up. And I always felt Christopher had to, you know, when I came back here, no one knew who Christopher Emmanuel was. Just don't know. And even now, people know the voice. They will always, I would be like in grocery stores and I would be talking and someone would bend the corner. Um, Emmanuel? I would be like, yes. Still, I mean, now they are getting to know the person because the newspaper seems to, and all the online <laughs> <laughs> blogs seems to have a liking to whatever it is be saying or whatever I don't say properly. So now they are getting a liking to who I am. But when I came back here, no one knew. Up to, up to 2010 in elections, no one knew. Up to 2014, no one knew who Christopher Emmanuel was, but they all know it now. So I had to make that name. You had to make people know who you are. And that's long, what I was walking on. How long did that take you? How much years are we talking about? We are talking from since 2003 to now 2017. But the first time I got elected was 2014. Mm. So imagine you started from 2003, and the first time you got elected 
was. But it, 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 you know, the votes keep going up and going up and going up and going up and going up, which is a good thing, I believe. So then you're probably doing something right. And that's, that's keeping that momentum and that fire burning and pushing and pushing. Once in Parliament, um, did you immediately get comfortable with this new task and this new role? Was it a, a harsh reality, a wake-up call um, to the dealings of, of the work of Parliament? Parliament was tough. Parliament was tough, and it was tough in the sense of you're on your own. There, there, is, there, is, there is no one around to simply say, listen, you know, I mean, I mean, Within the ministry of, of, of Rami, you have people around you. And they would guide you, they would direct you, they would give you advice. But ultimately, the decision is yours. But you have that, that, that core staff around you. You know, you can shoot your ideas. And I mean, basically, the, and the good thing with, 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 with all of us within the ministry, they would tell you, no, I don't like this. So it wouldn't be sugar-coated because you're the minister. Oh, this is what it is with, with, with us at the cabinet. You know, it, I mean, even if they walk off and say, minister, I don't like that, okay? And, and that's it. That's not how parliament is. You, you, you on your own. You're on your own. You better do your own research. You better have your own speaking times. And many of times, because I'm not one to write as much, but I would keep speaking over and over and over until I retain what I want to say. And that was always my battle. And many of times I would catch myself in the mirror or at night looking up in the, in the ceiling and repeating how I'm going to deliberate or articulate whatever comes for Parliament the next day. And we had some long hours. Sometimes we would start probably 9, 10 in the morning and all 2 the next morning we are still going when we have um, budget <laughs> debates and stuff. So, But I liked it though. I liked it though. It was solid in my own element because you got to grow up. And that's what I like about it. Yeah. The issues that you wanted to address, um, I'm sure the campaign trail, you were able to articulate what it is that you were yeah. fighting for through your broadcasting. You, you stood for many issues. Um, once on the floor of Parliament, your opportunity there, what did you choose to focus on? You know, yeah, and it's exactly what we are doing right now. But I always, I always say that the way people are being treated in this country, and whether it's from the smallest person to the oldest person, I have a serious problem with our customer service and care to people. You know, I think we have been lacking in that for a very, very long time. Somewhere along our line, we have lost that empathy, that sort of, of caring for the other person. You know, and I... I start to shoot at Telem, I start to shoot at GEBE, I start to shoot at all the government-owned companies that render service to people in the manner in which they do it, the grocery stores, the food prices, gasoline prices, you know, I mean, the expense and why our people are suffering in this, in this country. So I started to pick and pick and pick at those sort of things, the unfair treatment in which government is spending money in areas and... You know, simply not putting that money or that resources in human beings. We would throw up a $100 million project here, another $100 million project there. But I, would, I mean, if we got to spend $5 million on something that's going to benefit people, is always a discussion. It's always something that, oh, we need to look at this, we need to look at that. But to throw up whatever project that is, all, every project seems to be $100 million. But whenever it comes to people is try to minimize it as much as possible. And I always had a problem with that. Any challenges that you... A lot of challenges. A lot of challenges. A lot of challenges. Your vision and overall mission for the ministry, taking on the responsibility as minister, can you articulate that for us? Yeah, well, of course. You know, I always, I always wonder, you know, because you asked me about my challenges. And like I mentioned, I always ask people, how many departments are there in the ministry of Romy? And everyone would be like, oh, you mean how many departments? I say, how many departments do we have in the Ministry of Rummy? You know, we have more than one, more than two, more than three, more than four, more than five departments in the Ministry of Rummy. And they all have department heads. And they all would come to work sometimes having a bad day, just not in the mood and understaffed. We have had requests for building permits still out from since 2013. And I remember one time calling the department and they say, 
why, why, why is it that building permits take a year, a year and a half, six months? Why? I said, can you send me, you know, a list of all building permits? And his question was, what do you mean? I said, send me the list of all outstanding building permits. His next question was, from which year? And I was like, what do you mean from which year? He said, I need to know if you want from 2015, 2016, 2014, 20... I said, you have building permits existing request? He said, yeah, we have them from all of 2010. I said, but, I mean, that's, that's like seven years ago. Yeah, we just don't have the staff. But it, it, it is said so casual. So, yeah, we just don't have the staff to really get all the work done. You know, and those are the things, those are some of the challenges. And it's a culture down at the ministry of, of, of Verme, you know. And it's sort of changing that culture and bringing it across in sort of a more somber way that the tail of the dog doesn't wag the head. The head of the dog wags the tail. But the culture that we have at the Ministry of Rami is that the tail wags the head. And changing that culture is very, very, very tasking. Many would look at your um, four-year um, tenure that you are embarking on yeah. now and, and challenge you in regard specifically to the environment as it relates yeah. to the dump. Yeah. Um, and you have actually hit the ground running as soon as you became minister when it comes to this particular topic. Uh, what's the way forward in regard to this? It's priority number one. We, I have, uh, and again, thanks to Ms. Myers in the cabinet. You know, that was one of the tasks that I gave her in terms of the priorities. And every morning I sit down and I look at it directly, a big poster with priorities on it. And the number one priority, you would see the garbage dump and the solution, you would see a facility. And we are all famous or known, you always hear the waste to energy. And I tell people, Cedric, I, I will get it done. It will get done. It, it's going to cost us. We're going to pay for it. You know, we are one of the only islands in the Caribbean that doesn't pay for garbage or doesn't pay for disposal of garbage. You know, we, we, we will throw out our mattress, our old fridge, our old stove. But someone picks it up. Who do you think pays for that? You don't pay for it as it is right now. And I'm saying to the people of St. Martin that, that, that it's, it's the priority number one for me. And I, I am going to fix this problem that we have. But it's going to cost us. You will have to pay for it. And there is no, there is no, no, no ins and outs about it. How it's going to be done, that is still to be determined. But the only solution is a mind change. We simply cannot dispose of our waste the way we are accustomed of doing it. It cannot work anymore. The landfill, it's to its, its exist. It cannot go anymore. And I always tell people, we all, and we are very reactive in St. Martin, but, 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 we should take precaution because we are being warned on many occasions about the landfill. I'm very, very, very cautious with my words when I talk about the landfill, when I talk about people have to move from within that area and that vicinity. They have to move. I'm not mincing my words with it. You will have to move. I, th I believe this is like the fourth death we had on the landfill with a truck ran over someone. It's like the fourth time this has happened. You know, we have people that live on the dump, make a living from the landfill, but the way we do it now cannot be done anymore. Separation of garbage will have to start within your home. I just came back from the Waste Expo, very, 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 very informative, and I hope, and it's one of the things I would be recommending to all garbage collectors and haulers, you need to go to the Waste Expo. You need to see the different technologies that they have, different equipment, different method, different. You just need to be there. We are doing it the old-fashioned way. That's what we are doing. But at this point in time, Cedric, you can't be throwing your plastics in the same bin with, 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 with your cans and your papers and your food. And it, it's, No, it, it can't work anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work anymore. One of the initiatives that um, we've seen you champion also is um, 
housing. Yes. And the ability for, uh, for our people yes. to be able to gain access to yes. affordable homes. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that initiative. You know, I have a cousin who's 29 years old. I saw him, I saw him when he was born. And when he was born, my aunt and my mom, we were living in an apartment. And he's 29 years old. But we was living in that apartment five, six years before he was born. He is 29 today. My aunt has been renting an apartment for 37 years. I said, Martin, I know. For 37 years. Why, why, why must you reach the age of 50 to finally own your own home? Why? In St. Martin. Why? I had my first home when I was 26, but I had help. My grandmother already had a foundation up to ring beam. I had help. You know, so I just had to finish it. But imagine the largest block in St. Martin. The banks doesn't look at them. Why? We're in the business of tourism. That's the business we're in. So majority of the people in this country, on this island, work in casinos, work in restaurants, work in hotels, work in bars. But they are the largest block that is being excluded from a quiet. Why? Because they don't have that vast deans, that, that, what do you call, um, permanent job, if I should use. That, that's the word that I'm looking for. Taxi drivers, bus drivers. So when you look at a regular bartender, you will say, how much does he go home with? Or how much does he make? Oh, he makes probably $800 a month. How much does he go home with? The, 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 someone would say, probably six. No. He may be going home with seven. But in his hand, he has $2,000. Because he's making $300 every week in tips. But that $300, the bank doesn't recognize. Because it's not on paper. It's not intangible that they can hold and say, this is part of your salary. So, so home ownership has been something elusive, something out of touch, out of reach for the regular, average person in St. Martin. Even those in government. Why? Interest rates. Because majority of the banks look at it at their bottom line as profit-based because they are commercial banks. But when you start to look at developing a country, the more homes you give to people, the better. Because now they have to pay light, they have to pay water. They're going to dress up, they're going to go shopping, they want fridge stove, microwave, they want dryer and washer, they, because they have a home. Minister, thank you very much. There's so much things that we could continue yes. to talk about, uh, especially as it relates to the ministry. We get into infrastructure and things of that sort, but I'm sure that this is a, an ongoing conversation that we'll yes. have in the near future. I want to thank you for taking the thank time you very much. to sit down with us. And to, of course, to our viewers, we'd like to thank you for tuning in and being a part of the program. If you've missed this edition, we invite you to log on to the official government websites at martingov.org for video on demand of Inside Government. I'm C. Duke Peterson on behalf of the Department of Communication. Thanks for tuning in.